Father, we are grateful to you for this time, Lord. Thank you very much for bringing us again uh, here through this platform to learn and to uh, encourage one another with your word and to grow in your knowledge and in knowledge of your scripture. Lord, help our study together. We ask for your leading and guidance. We want to hear your voice through your servant and uh, we, are, we want to ask you to help, help us in opening our minds and hearts to the new realities and great realities uh, uh, of truth and uh, help us so that we may be able to receive and perceive and receive it and uh, we may be able to teach it to others as well, Lord. Throughout our uh, study, Lord, through the lecture and through the discussions, your name be exalted. May this time be a time of blessing in each and every one of our lives. Thank you very much for listening to us. And we submit this hour at your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, over the past, uh, I think it was three weeks, we have been studying uh, the subject of sacraments or uh, from a, from a non-Catholic perspective, we would call it an ordinance. Uh, we have gone through a study of baptism and of course we did uh, some you know extra time on infant baptism. Uh, once again, I presume that it was helpful, it was useful, and uh, we know that there can still be questions which we will be happy to uh, entertain and we can discuss those. So feel free to write your questions down and send it to us. But I hope you also recognize that we have made our GCI position very clear in terms of what we practice as we understand it today and as the Holy Spirit leads us and if we believe that the Holy Spirit has led us into further truth, then we will obviously be willing to take a relook into every one of these teachings. So let me leave baptism uh, beside now or behind us and move forward and today we will uh, move into uh, the Lord's Supper or the Communion, which is another very important uh, ordinance, an act of worship that we mm -hmm. uh, engage in. And I believe that it is something very meaningful for all of us. And once again, you will notice that uh, over the many years, GCI has continued to remain open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We have come to understand it perhaps in a much more mature way non-legalistic, uh, and I believe that it is only going to be more and more helpful and more meaningful, even as we recognize what the scriptures say about the Lord's Supper. So we are going to once again go back to the reading of those questions and the answers. We will pause and uh, look at some of the uh, points that we can discuss. So let's move ahead and discuss the question 8.8 .8 in our book, which brings in the subject of the Lord's Supper. Uh, if Praveen is able to bring that up on the screen, then you can read along with me. We are going to start in 8.8. .8. The question reads, what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper? Let's not forget that we are discussing these important ordinances of uh, the church. Uh, these are something that we are, you know, constantly, uh, we, we do on a regular basis. Uh, we believe in because they have tremendous amount of meaning. And so the question asks, what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper? And now we are obviously going to do a very broad study, uh, or rather we are not going to do a very in-depth study. And I would like sometime later, maybe we can come back to these subjects and do much more in-depth studies. So here we are doing a much more uh, a broader perspective, to have a broader perspective. Now the answer in the, of the question in 8.8 .8 reads, in the Lord's Supper, also called communion and the Eucharist, we partake of bread and wine in remembrance of our Savior, proclaiming his death until he comes again. The Lord's Supper is a participation in the death and resurrection of our Lord, just as the bread and wine become 
part of our physical bodies, so we are made by grace to partake spiritually of Jesus Christ in his body and blood. Thus, the Lord's Supper declares to believers that in every aspect of their Christian life, they rely not on any obedience or righteousness of their own, but solely upon the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So that gives you a very broad, broad perspective. Uh, the basic meaning of why, of what, what the Lord's Supper means to us. Notice it says, we are doing this uh, in remembrance of our Savior, proclaiming his death until he comes again. So there is a uh, past element to the Lord's Supper, the communion. We are remembering something that happened in the past, but it is done in the present as we participate in the elements, the bread and the wine. But it's also future looking. We are looking to the future of the second coming of Jesus. So the communion basically is completely focused on Jesus, that his death for us brings us, you know, uh, redemption. And today as we participate, believe and participate in it, it brings union with him. And then, of course, the second coming of Jesus, when we, uh, the, the union is consummated, where we have uh, a, you know, an eternal union with him, uh, which we can celebrate which we are celebrating in the present. So it's very interesting to notice the past, the present and the future element of the communion. Um, not only are we re remembering and doing something that gives us a past, present, future focus, it also says that the Lord's Supper is a participation in the death and resurrection of our Lord. So we are not only remembering his death, but we are also participating in that death. We want to symbolically put our old selves to death and be in union with uh, Jesus Christ our Lord to be able to live uh, in the reality that he now gives to us uh, in his resurrection, right? And finally, of course, in the future in his resurrected glorified body. So there is a participation element also mm -hmm. in it. So the Lord's Supper is giving us that meaning of how we can participate. Uh, one more thought on this particular point. Uh, it says the Lord's Supper declares to believers that in every aspect of their Christian life, they rely not on any obedience or righteousness of their own, but solely upon the grace of God in Christ. So the communion is also showing that where our reliance is, where our dependence is on a spiritual perspective, our dependence is not on what we do or obey or whatever, but uh, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the communion has a past, present, future element. The communion has a participation element and the communion then is also uh, a, a reality that our dependence is on Christ. It is in his grace that we have uh, ultimate redemption and union, which is uh, accomplished in the Holy Spirit. So that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit brings us into union with Christ. So on a broad scale, on a broad perspective, that is what the communion means to us. And so it has a lot of very rich meaning. And I think this is something that uh, we, you know, uh, enjoy doing we, because it is so very purposeful. All right. So uh, let's just let me just make one final point before we move to the next question. Both 
the ordinances that we observe, which are baptism and communion, points to Christ. The, the whole thing is, you know, Christocentric, if you want to use a theological term. Both of it shows our dependence on Christ. Both of it shows our immersion in Christ and our, uh, you know, complete reliance on Jesus Christ. So once again, uh, it is very central to Christ. And that is why it is meaningful to us. It is not something that, you know, just uh, has something to do with only us, but it has mostly something to do with Christ and, and his union with us. Having said that, let's move to the next question and then we will read the answer. The question is 8.9 in the notes. And the question reads, what is required of people when they come to receive the Lord's Supper? Okay, uh, I think the screen has shifted. Maybe Praveen can bring back the screen. Uh, Sorry, the, 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 the application closed suddenly. Oh, okay. Give me a All moment. right. Let me read the question while Praveen brings back the screen a little later. No, it's done. Yeah. Okay. So it is 8.9. The question again reads, uh, what is required of people when they come to receive the Lord's Supper? <laughs> and once again, we are getting into uh you know some of those uh what do you say sticky controversial debatable issues 8.9 and 8.10 especially now can uh, bring in some debate so but ne nevertheless uh, we are open to debate and we like uh, discussion on these so the question reads what you know is there any requirement for us to be able to come to receive the Lord's Supper? Let's read the answer and make some comment. That in response to the proclamation of the word of God, they come to receive the grace of God made available to all through Jesus Christ. Right? So this is a response. Don't forget. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Let me continue to read the answer. They are to come to the table with open hearts ready to be identified with Christ, ready to depend upon him, ready to follow him, ready to give up whatever stands in the way of living out of trust in him and in his word to them. Coming to his table, that's the Lord's table, they will have repented of their sins and be ready to leave behind any sin that might be revealed even at the table. They will come intending to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit to depend on Christ and his faithfulness. Above all, they will receive Christ anew, rejoicing in the gift of communion they can have with him and through him with the Father and the Spirit. They will do so looking forward to Jesus' return and the coming of the fullness of the kingdom of God. So, uh, just to pick up a few points from there, we are answering the question, what is required of people? Is there a qualification for us to come to the table? Is there something required of us before we do so? Many churches, other churches, in fact, I, I think it is the Catholic Church also mentions quite a bit of requirements. Uh, but let's look at what we believe. It says, uh, we are responding by coming to the table. We are actually responding, making a response to receive the grace of God made available to all through Jesus Christ. That response is, I think, vital. So the very act of coming to the table, the very act of coming and receiving the Holy Spirit is actually a response. We are doing it to uh, what you say, uh, manifest our belief, belief in the Lord Jesus. So that is, I think, very significant. Uh, this is one way we are responding. But there is now other aspects of that response which we need to keep in mind. We are coming to the table 
uh, responding in belief, but we are also recognizing that we are ready to be identified with Christ because we are receiving Christ and, and we are accepting his reception of us. We are ready to depend upon him, ready to follow him, ready to give up whatever stands in the way of living out, of trust in him and in his word. So uh, along with that belief in Jesus, we are willing now to dedicate our life to a newness that is very, very clearly evident in the scriptures. Uh, especially sinful attitudes, sinful behaviors, sinful thoughts. Uh, we want to leave them behind because we know that uh, it harms us. Sin is something that is going to destroy us. We recognize that. And Jesus, having covered us with his blood, has removed the sin from us. So we don't want to go back into it. So there is a commitment to live a certain way of life. Uh, so all of this is part of the response as we come to the table. Okay. So basically what we're saying is it's an act of worship. And it means a lot to us in terms of remembering Christ and what he did for us. And now we are ready to respond in belief of what Christ did for us. And then uh, willing to commit our lives to a certain way of lifestyle, a certain way of behavior. Uh, even going to the very depth of our thinking and our hearts, which covers also the emotion. So... Uh, uh, all of this is something that we keep in mind as we come to the table. That shows that if we, are, we are not treating it as just a ritual. It is not some magical ritual that you just do and completely forget. No, we come contemplating, we come reflecting, we come recognizing the need for us to be, uh, you know, uh, submit submissive and submitting ourselves to a particular standard that jesus christ leaves for us and of course the very standard is himself right so you could say that we are certainly renewing our commitment to christ we are recognizing uh, and confirming that we need a relationship with jesus christ so all of these thoughts envelope that response as we come to the table all right so that is basically what we teach with regards to uh you know uh, a requirement in terms of coming to the lord's supper once again let me just mention that we try not to make it just a ritual it is not just a you know once in a month kind of a thing to do we are doing it very meaningfully uh, recognizing all of these things that we just discussed. We will go to the next question. This is 8.10 uh, in, uh, in, the, in the booklet. And here, is, here comes, and again, <laughs> another one of those uh, uh, debatable you know, perspectives that we could have. The question reads, who may receive the Lord's Supper? All right, so who is it that we believe can come to the table to participate in the communion? Let's read the answer. All may receive it who receive Christ in faith, rejoicing in so great a faith, who confess their sins, and who in faith intend to lead the new life that Christ shares with them. This includes children who have expressed a desire to participate and have been instructed in the meaning of the sacrament in a way they can understand. So make sure that you get what is actually written there. Don't go off into making any conclusions. Let's finish the answer. Receiving the Lord's Supper will normally have taken place after the person has been instructed and baptized but for adults, the Lord's Supper can be received upon their first hearing the word of God 
proclaimed and in response desire to receive Christ by partaking of it. Instruction and baptism would then normally follow. All right, so uh, I think uh, the answer hopefully is sufficiently clear. Uh, basically all, but who is this all? Uh, the, the all is reference is, is referring to those who have faith in Christ. So that is the reason why we say it's not a, just a ritual. It is a meaningful act of displaying and showing our faith in Christ. So all may receive it who have who receive Christ in faith, right? So belief is very important. Now, uh, the question, remember, says, who can receive the Lord's Supper? And the obvious question is, just as we discussed in baptism, what about children? Right? Now, uh, there is a qualification here. Children uh, may receive it, but should have been instructed in the meaning of the sacrament in a way that they understand. So here we make a distinction. Baptism, we believe, is an immersion in Christ. Uh, it's an inclusion in the body, in the uh, community uh, that is identified in Christ. But taking of the Lord's Supper is a very deliberate act on the individual that it is done with faith and it is done with understanding. So children who can understand uh, what they are doing and what they are taking uh, well, I suppose we would not bar them from doing it. So once again, what we are saying is, it is not the age that is the criterion. It is the, it is the understanding level of the child that is more important. All right. Um, now, we also say that the Lord's Supper can be taken uh, by somebody who may not have been baptized in the way we see baptism is, but who have expressed faith. Um, and they may be instructed to take baptism. But remember, participating in the Lord's table is faith in Jesus Christ. That is the most important element. So uh, we believe that we can administer uh, communion to those who express their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, uh, there is a, there are some denominations that, you know, believe differently. Um, there are some denominations that say that, you know, those who don't belong to that denomination cannot participate. Uh, you know, because they believe that only their denomination is having the right understanding of it and everybody who participates must participate accordingly with that understanding. So they may deny uh, the partaking of the Lord's Supper in their denomination un until you belong to their denomination, you know, in either in membership or whatever criteria they, they lay down. Uh, but for GCI, we believe that we leave the decision of that faith, whether they believe and they uh, do they understand to them. We don't try to become too, what do you say? Uh, we don't police their thinking. We explain that it must be done through a proper understanding of what the elements mean and do they have faith in it? And then we leave it to the individual to decide and then either go forward to take the communion or not. Uh, in this regard, I would like to just turn a page. I'm not sure, if, Praveen, if you can go to page 31. Uh, and I'd like to read one section from there so that this becomes a little bit more clear. If you go down uh, to, in GCI, who is permitted? It says, uh, yeah, there you are. 
in GCI, notice it says in GCI, who is permitted to take part to permitted to partake of the Lord's Supper? Once again, I bring you the what do you call it, uh, the GCI position with regards to this. And let me just read through that because this is uh, in addition to what we uh, just discussed. It says GCI serves the Lord's Supper to all who come in repentance and faith. While such people normally will have been baptized, GCI does not make prior baptism a requirement for receiving communion. Children, in brackets infants, who are younger than the age of personal awareness. So this is the qualification that we put for communion. Who are, <clears throat> are younger than the age of personal awareness, even if baptized as infants, should delay partaking of the Lord's Supper until they are old enough to be aware of the meaning of what they are doing. An alternative for these infants is to come to the table with an adult and there receive a blessing from the officiant rather than the communion element. All right, so children can come forward to receive a blessing who do not understand it, but uh, we would prefer that they do not partake of the element. I wanted to bring this as the uh, an addition to what we discussed so that you can be very clear as to what the GCR position is. All right, uh, so, we hopefully have answered the question who may receive the Lord's Supper. Once again, uh, feel free to ask any questions you may have. What I'll do is, I'll, there is one last question left, 8.11. Let's finish reading that and then we will pause for some discussion. Uh, we'll go to 8.11. It says, the, re the question is, what is expected of people after they have shared in the Lord's Supper? Okay, What is expected of the people after they have shared the Lord's Supper? The, the answer is, having been renewed in the union with Christ and his people through sharing in the Lord's Supper, it is expected that they will continue by the Spirit and under the written word of God to live in holiness, avoiding sin, showing love and forgiveness to all and serving others freely in gratitude and in the hope of Christ's return in power and glory. So what is expected of people who are partaking of the Lord's Supper? I could use a simple phrase which we use very often now. Uh, we, we believe that they must continue to participate in the life of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit leads us, we must continue to participate. So communion is a renewal of our commitment to participate in the life of Christ. And of course, the life we know is a, is a uh, you know, immersing ourselves in a sense of holiness and avoiding sin, uh, continuing to manifest the love of God, which includes forgiveness for all, living in you know, not having bearing grudges against one another and serving, serving the larger body of Christ and even those who are outside of the faith. Uh, why do we do that? Because we are expressing our gratitude that Jesus Christ has redeemed us and included us and they uh, may also become part of the household of faith. So, we continue to participate in the life of Christ. So, in, 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 in uh, conclusion, before we go into our discussion, uh, communion is a very unifying factor. It is a sign of our uni being united in Christ. Uh, accepting the fact that Jesus has done for us something we could never do for ourselves. So it unites us as brothers and sisters in Jesus as we come to the table to participate in the body and the blood of Christ, knowing that we are immersing ourselves or rather we are renewing our commitment to Christ to live, manifest his love, you know. And this sign of, uh, or this ordinance of unity, I hope will not be used for disunity by going into all kinds of, you know, uh, what do you say, uh, 
controversies and trying to debar people and trying to exclude people. We hope that this will be a unifying factor and not be used for uh, disunity. Having said that now, uh, let me open it up for some discussions or any questions that you might have. Um, very happy to see many of you uh, joining in today. Please go ahead and uh, make any comments, Praveen and uh, Nelson uh, and uh, Franklin. Uh, Yoshila, if you have any thoughts that you'd like to add to what we have discussed, please feel free so that you know we can uh, be enriched by even thoughts that the Holy Spirit is putting in your mind. Franklin, you had a thought? Uh, please uh, unmute yourself, Franklin. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead with your question. Yes, sir. If I, if I can digress a little bit. Yes. There's a controversy regarding at what frequency should we participate? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, oh, in your opinion, uh, are you suggesting something? Are you? Do you believe in a in a particular frequency? If no, you can no, sir. Uh, I would like to know uh, what is the biblical position and what is GCI position? Okay. Okay. Once again, uh, in my understanding, uh, just as we do not legislate an age, what age you must part you partake of the Lord's Supper? We only say that it must be done with a sense of meaning, with a sense of awareness. So in that respect, children who are below the age of that kind of awareness and understanding, we would discourage from taking. Similarly, uh, the Bible has no specific injunction. I'm coming to the new covenant. If you look at the Passover, that is of course done on a yearly basis, but we are moved to the new covenant, Lord's Supper, Nowhere in the scriptures it says that it's done at a particular time or at a particular frequency. There is only one reference to frequency. It says, as often as you do it, <laughs> you're remembering the Lord's death. As often as you do it. In other words, it's not saying you should do it often. It's saying whenever you do it, you remember that Lord's, the Lord's death. And of course, as is coming. That is what I believe and understand, and that is what that's the GCI position. Sir, may I add? Uh, yes, uh, Joshua. Uh, uh, I think um, the Lord's Supper. What in regard to that? I mean, it has become Lord's Supper from the time Jesus broke the bread with his disciples on the last night he was with them on the earth. Uh, but even before that, whenever the disciples and uh, Jesus, they all met, they, they broke uh, bread together. It was their practice. So uh, I don't think, I mean, this is purely my opinion. Uh, I don't think even if we do the same, remembering Christ and participate in God's Supper, whenever we meet also is not wrong. This is my opinion. Um, or even if we do it on a monthly basis also is fine. Uh, the, as you have told, the basic idea is to remember Christ's sacrifice and to participate in it with co complete awareness and also complete surrender, I think. Uh, so this is what I, I could uh, understand. But I don't think would it be wrong even if we do it, it is... Uh, it could be a matter of convenience also. If we can do it every week also, I don't think it's a, anything to, I mean, wrong or something like that. Thank you, Joshila, for your thoughts. Uh, I think you brought in an interesting point there. You mentioned about uh, breaking bread, which is actually a reference to eating a meal. And this was done, uh, and Christ did it, you know, on, uh, on a regular basis, eating meals with the disciples. But of course, the way we have understood communion is that the night before he was, uh, you know, the, uh, he was arrested and then, of course, sent to the crucifixion. Uh, he, he, he did a special, 
you could say he instituted something very special with that meal of course it was part of a meal but there was something very special about it hello uh, hello ruth uh, uh, joshua mm -hmm. you saying are you yes sir coming? no no it's not me i think linda linda your mic I'm is sorry, not muted i lost you okay linda you wanted to say something I was, I was not sure what a question was being asked yes linda was on some other call okay uh, that's what we overheard okay but yes uh, if i can just come back to uh, what uh, we had discussed uh, it was part of a meal and it isn't it interesting that every time we eat a meal we pray and and i am very conscious of the fact that as i eat a meal i realize it is nourishing my physical body but what about the spiritual nourishment we get it from jesus and so every time i pray i'm constantly remembering of my spiritual nourishment which is jesus and of course communion is symbolic of that too so but once again the question with regards to frequency and how often i think is something that we have moved past it becomes very legalistic to say you can do it only uh, you know once a month or once a year or every week some people do it on a daily basis uh, the bible has left that open as long as you do it with a sense of significance and meaning that is what is necessary Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Sir, may I ask a question? Uh, Anand, go ahead. Previously, we encouraged only people, only who are baptized, to participate in the Lord's Supper. And now, with the understanding that we have, we can ask anybody who believes. Anand, you're still with us. I think uh, did we lose Anand? Anand? Okay, uh, we'll just wait for him to come back. I think Anand's question was. Uh, Sir, I'll. Yes, go ahead, Anand. Finish will... your question. Yeah, but now we can Sir, ask I'll... anybody to participate in the Lord's Supper if they believe. No, now uh, it happened so that you know my son Nathan uh, knows what who God is and what is. He asked us many times, "Can I also participate?" So the question for me rises: Can he participate? Well, he believes, and he to not to that extent where you know he realizes that much i understand okay yeah <laughs> once again it's one of those uh, uh not so easy question to answer but let me just try see uh, what we say is belief is necessary uh and so why do we say that uh, even if you're not baptized uh belief is necessary why do we say that because uh you are we are doing it not as a ritual but very meaningfully very purposefully now in the scriptures we know the examples in the book of acts shows us that people believed and received the holy spirit before baptism now if that is possible did that shows me that god has already given them the belief and accepted them even before they could formally show their or manifest their belief through baptism similarly you can believe and hence participate in the lord's supper even if you are not baptized because what is what is important is belief because that belief has now immersed you or brought you in communion with our lord jesus christ so in that respect baptism is not uh, what you say the only requirement to take uh, what do you say uh, what do you uh, the, the the elements it is it is possible that you can be baptized and don't have belief and in that respect i would think that it would be wrong for a person to take the element now you come to a child like nathan now 
See, I don't know how much he understands. I wouldn't know how much he uh, is in a position to say that I know Jesus to be my savior because I am a sinner and I need salvation. I need redemption. And my redemption is only in Christ. There is nothing I can do to receive that re redemption. Now, I'm not sure if he understands all of that in the way that I've just explained. If I have a doubt, I would delay it. I would tell him, uh, we would like you to continue to learn about Jesus. And as you grow and, uh, you know, explain to us how you believe. And then, like I said, there is no age. Does that make any sense, uh, Anna? Did we lose Anna? I don't see. Uh, no, he's still there. Does it make sense, uh, Anna? We can't hear you for some reason. Your voice is not coming through. Uh, We'll just wait for Anand to get connected. Any other thoughts or questions that you might have? Uh, Praveen, if you have any thoughts to add, feel free to do so. We have another 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Definitely, Lord Supper is one of the very complex subjects to discuss, and there are so many controversies, and it would bring forth uh, so many questions. And uh, just like uh, how I discussed about baptism previously, regarding the Lord Supper, also uh, I would like to make few comments, which should, uh, which are uh, uh, typically uh, reading the passages, Lord Supper passages in their context, in the in their biblical context. That's what I would like to present to you. Previously, Joshua brought forth how Jesus was having meals with the disciples even before uh, his crucifixion. Uh, apart from that special night also. The, uh, we, but one thing we need to realize, usually the meals Jewish people have and the meal Jesus had along with his disciples is, I mean, the night he was arrested, he was quite different. Uh, the uh, the passage starts with Jesus giving thanks to the Lord and he broke the bread. Jewish people don't pray don't pray to the Lord before eating the food. Jewish people pray to the Lord and thank God after they are full and they are satisfied. I say thank God for giving me tummy full of food. That is uh, that is what um, explained in uh, Deuteronomy. That's what they practice. But here. He start, directly started giving thanks to the Lord and he broke the bread and distributed. It definitely shows there is a difference uh, between the other meals and this particular meal. And this particular meal has a message. This may, there were so many nights Jesus could take up and uh, he can speak here at uh, uh, Simon's house, Matthew's house, various places while he was e eating. Mary came, well, one place Mary came and washed his feet. There were so many times, but he did not take the opportunity of all those events. He took the opportunity to speak about it, especially on day of uh, Passover and then his uh, following the following crucifixion. So he is connecting us to that thing. So when we interpret the Lord's Supper, we should be always, I'm talking theologically, uh, when we interpret these uh, passages or when we talk about Lord's Supper, we should uh, in, uh, inter sorry, uh, interpret them in the light of the Passover as well as the message the New Covenant uh, gives us and the purpose. So Passover is a message of our redemption. So Jesus, he is speaking about the New Covenant and he asked us to participate. So definitely it is talking about as a celebration of our redemption, number one. And number two, in the new covenant, we are participating with the Jesus Christ that is there. And uh, the reason I'm bringing for bringing these is because I want to compare these things along with the uh, first Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, as we read the question number nine point, yeah, sorry, 8.9, uh, what is required of humans or what is required of us when we partake 
in the communion and the verse is given first corinthians chapter 11 27 to 30 if we read those words in its context it has a different message uh, what's happening today is as we are talking about the passover sorry lord supper it is becoming more like a ritual in the church where constant uh, uh, what we call rededication process is taking place you know i'm there is nothing wrong in admitting the sin and confessing the sin but unfortunately there is a say, mindset it is say, coming into the christian minds the moment we go to the lord's supper we get into the rededication mode which is not christian and which is totally uh, discouraged in book of hebrews chapter 6 so we should not get into that rededication mode that we need to realize of course we realize uh, about our sin about our weaknesses but we have to realize them and admit them and understand them and uh, deal with them in the light of the new covenant if we are not able to do that it will become a constant uh, uh, repeating ritual where we will be rededicating and hurting ourselves and we do not we do not recognize what christ has done for us what christ has done for us was once for all you are forgiven you are taken away from sin definitely we have weaknesses and we admit them before god but our salvation is not based on that when we come to the lord's supper our understanding should be of course i am weak I'm, uh, i have committed sin but i come i admit uh, sorry i identify myself in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and I partake in his blood and wine, uh, which symbolizes my redemption, just like the Passover is a message of our redemption, which has already happened. So oh, that's what we are going to do. Uh, so especially if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the pro when Apostle Paul was writing about uh, communion, uh, he says, uh, those who take it in unworthy manner have suffered sickness as some of them have passed away. We need to define what is taking it in worthy, worthy manner. We talk about uh, taking it in unworthy manner caused damage. What is worthy manner? In order to understand what this worthy manner define it, we need to read the entire chapter. In fact, if you get time, entire First Corinthians. If you read entire chapter, it starts with uh, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, it uh, starts with saying there are divisions, there are people uh, who are not able to mingle with other people. They come to the Lord's Supper, they eat it fast, and they finish the food, and so that others don't have poor people and other people are, they are not even able to get food. There is totally uh, a, uh, what we'll call a gap or a breakage of uh, so some togetherness or is standing for so caring for one another that particular thing is missing in first corinthians i mean in church in the first corinthians uh, letter that's how the chapter starts and uh, the, after 30 verse 30 also if you read he says therefore uh, just let me read that then only i'll be able to make uh, some sense i believe uh, as i said uh, these people used to come and they used to eat and uh, they used to drink and they don't care about people here one thing we need to uh, uh, we need to focus that is verse 29 for he who eats and drinks in unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the lord's body if you read the original text uh, of these particular words the word lord's body lord is missing you are missing you are uh, you are not discerning, you are not able to connect to the body. What is that body? The body is church. Uh, taking uh, uh, Previously, we have discussed about this. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, Lord's Supper, we discussed about trans-elementation, in which we focus on the purpose of the Lord's Supper, which is fellowship, a communion. So here, the communion is breaking. These people are not concerned about others, and they are eating up. There, Apostle Paul says, uh, you know, you should be taking it in worthy manner. And you are not, some people are not considering the body. The body is not Jesus' body. The body is actually the church, the way the fellowship functions. 
and uh, he after saying those words verse 33 he says therefore which means based on what i have already said my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and rest and the rest i will settle as i will set in order when i come so after speaking about this he is saying you be concerned about one another so when we come to the church when we come for the communion if in the in our congregation if we are missing any thing called standing for one another you know standing for each other concern for others if that is missing then our our we are bringing judgment upon ourselves the focus of the communion is fellowship so here uh first corinthians in, in corinthians that is what they are missing in our church also sometimes it happens i came from such background where if communion is given to one particular lane in the church if they started with a particular pew they be other people get offended there should be people who have to receive first and then only church will be nice otherwise it is not there that is how there are divisions in the church if when we come for the communion and if we don't have the togetherness care for one anotherness then we are though we partake in the communion we are bringing judgment upon ourselves so what am i trying to explain through what i said is um, when we come to church and when we come to com- communion first point we need to re- always remember is about our redemption and let us not make it as a ritual where we constantly rededicate it's not a cycle of rededication process every week or once in month communion is not for that it's a celebration of our redemption and then communion is all about fellowship so we should be having the spirit of togetherness caring for one another and if that is missing we are bringing judgment upon ourselves and according to apostle paul's in first corinthians corinthians chapter 11 if you read it in the context taking it unworthy manner is having strives in the community in the group divisions in the group and partaking it and if we uh, when we never we come to the uh, communion we should take it in a worthy manner which is having uh, togetherness that's what we should be having and uh, we should be constantly encouraging and we should encourage our congregation to focus on our interpersonal relationship and because communion is all about that so we should be having that in mind so this is one thing i would like to bring forth i we wanted to encourage that let us not get into ritual and rededication cycle okay well i guess slowly the time has slipped out <laughs> uh but yes uh just to reiterate uh, points that pravin made uh we already discussed that it's not a ritual this rededication business comes when we think that we are separated from christ as though we need it's almost like a rebaptism uh no that doesn't happen once you are in christ you are in christ you're included so uh but maybe you know we use words like renewal i mean you're renewing yourself it's not that you're re you know you're reconnecting with christ but it is a it is a renewing a commitment to live a certain way of life so it's not a re dedication the way you explain it probably uh it's just a a conscious effort to say that i belong to christ so i must you know renew myself in a certain way of life so and of course uh, 1 corinthians uh, uh, 11 uh, is a very important one with regards to uh, what happened in the corinthian church that's a very uh, something that we have discussed time and again and constantly it's good for us to keep in mind that uh, those kinds of attitudes of division divisiveness uh, is something which is uh, is not appreciated by god god is a you know he brings us into unity and any kind of strife that breaks that unity is not right and uh, uh it's unfortunate but we struggle with that we struggle with that in all churches and uh, in our own church we are struggling with that 
and I sincerely hope and pray that God will put these things right so that we don't have to carry on with that strike. So that's very important. Any other final points? As uh, I don't want to delay you in case you have something else to do. Any comments? Uh, Ananda, uh, can you hear us? And can you, uh, is your uh, speaker, or rather your mic, is it okay? I'm not sure. If... Did you want to make any final comments, Anand? No, we're not able to hear uh, Anand. Okay, so uh, once again, what we have done is just a very basic discussion. Obviously, there are very deep points that we can go to. And maybe sometime down the line, as we carry on with our uh, discussions, we can come back and revisit some of these uh, doctrines. And we can do a much more thorough study. We can take it from different perspectives. So it's an ongoing, uh, what do you say, uh, quest on our part to want to learn more and love the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Okay, having said that, let's then close service, uh, or rather Bible study for today. Uh, may I request uh, Sikinder, if you can close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment of get together for the Bible study, of the weekly Bible study, Father. We thank you for that. Father, we have learned about the sacraments, and the baptism, and who has to take it, and who has not to take it, not legally, but spiritually we have to understand the faithfulness in us, the in the heart of hearts, what we think, what we do, we have to realize that, and take it in heart, and proceed in life towards prosperity of fellowship, and we ask your guidance on this and open up our minds and heart to learn the ways of God through these Bible studies. And we close this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.